As promised, high time for you to jump into these boxes with me and suck, squeeze, bang and blow. It'll make rather a pleasant change to free bagging here in the studio, especially in this deep Schittsvillian winter. Yes! This episode is designed for the particular titillation of Subaru of Files and other flat engine sickos. You know who you are. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where Aussie new car buyers save thousands off their next new cars. Hit me up on the website for that. Captain's Log, star date, 153624. Engine Nerd Month continues. We're pressing on with the applied physics of internal combustion layouts, even though it will almost certainly not get anyone laid. At least, not with a woman who is still breathing. As renowned social philosopher Alice Cooper so famously said about necrophilia 43 years ago, One thing, it's true, cold Ethel, I am stuck on you, and everything is my way. Ethel don't have much to say. So I guess there's hope, right? I wonder if he'd be allowed to release that single today, or if the social justice thought police would hunt him down to the end of the earth. Quote, One thing, no lie, Ethel's frigid as an Eskimo pie. There would probably be a call from a studio executive over that, at least. Probably a meeting. Anyway, boxers will do fours first. Carl Benz, the father of the three-pointed swastika, developed the boxer design in 1897. That's BT, before Twitter. The first four-cylinder boxer rolled out in a Benz race car at about the turn of the 20th century. All massive 5.4 litres of it, developing a staggering 20 horsepower. It was a wonder man could live at that speed. Encre bleu. Uh, Boxers also lend themselves to air cooling, oddly enough, mainly because half of the heat is on one side of the engine and half is on the other. So there's a lot of potential surface area for convective heat loss. All you need is fins and, of course, a bit of airflow. And this explains their utility. In the formerly ubiquitous DAC DAC or Volkswagen Beetle, Adolf Hitler's somewhat successful attempt at immortality. So... Fast forwarding to this century, inline fours and boxer fours had the same sort of firing pulses. There's a bang every 180 degrees of crank rotation, but the balance situation is profoundly different. Inline fours don't rock very much, but they have very poor secondary balance, which is why the high revving big displacement ones need those balance shafts. So they like idling smoothly, but they don't like a rev, inherently. Pretty much the reverse situation with Boxer 4s. They rock like a bastard in the Z-axis. That's a Z-axis in Trumpistan, because the pistons are offset, right? But on a more positive note, the Boxer configuration gives excellent secondary balance characteristics, so they really do like a rev. When I say they rock, right, you can imagine it like this. You're standing on the bonnet of a Subaru Impreza. That's a hood in Retardistan. You're holding a dirty big chrome vanadium crowbar and you drive it down with Iron Man strength, vertically down, straight through the mass centroid of the engine. Because this is a parallel universe, right, where that does not catastrophically destroy the engine because magic... What you would feel is the crowbar rotating slightly backwards and forwards about that vertical axis. It's like a spindle and the engine is a top, kind of with Tourette syndrome. This rotational rocking is because the pairs of cylinders are offset and there is no getting around that in a boxer. There's another problem, challenge, feature, whatever, whatever you want to call it. The firing pulses are right, right, left, left, or vice versa, the point being that both cylinders on one bank fire and then the other bank fires repeat. And that means if you want to have even scavenging of the cylinders, which is kind of essential to evenly refilling them with the next charge of air, you need long header pipes to merge the discharge ports from one bank to the other bank. And what I'm saying is that 
each cylinder fires once every two revs, right? Assuming it's a four stroke engine. That's 720 degrees of crank rotation. So there's one exhaust pulse per cylinder for every 720 degrees. So you need to pair every exhaust pulse with another pulse 360 degrees of rotation away or you don't get uniform combustion in every cylinder. And that means you need to join the exhaust ports across the width of the engine between the banks, okay? It's a real estate challenge more than anything else because space in an engine bay is extremely limited. So why don't boxes and inline fours sound the same given there's the same number of combustion events per revolution? Riddle me that. It's because in older designs, they just merged the left bank exhaust into one manifold and the right bank into the other, and they joined them up into a single tailpipe and they lived with the uneven exhaust pulses, the uneven filling of the cylinders and the uneven combustion that resulted. And that's where the typical dak dak burble noise characteristic comes from. Our good friends at Subaru, which incidentally managed to teleport its somewhat niche business into the huge monolith that it is today by building it on just two pillars, right? The boxer engine and symmetrical all-wheel drive. Well, they managed to put a magic, equal length, even pulsing exhaust system into competition in the World Rally Championships in the 1990s. And that system went into the Liberty, that's a Retardistani legacy, in 2003, then Forrester in 05, Impreza in 07, and the Dak Dak Burble thus receded from memory gradually. WRX has lost it in 2015 because the exhaust there feeds a centrally mounted turbo. But the STI, with its somewhat antique engine, retains the uneven length headers, but that's the one that's probably next for the chop. And of course, one of the reasons WRX is to get tweaked heavily in the aftermarket game, one of the reasons they sound so distinctive is obviously that they put the burble back with a suitably uneven exhaust, like it's still there waiting to burst forth from the closet of conformity in every factory flat four Subaru. So, moving to flat sixes, they do not have this latent dak dak sounding ability. Essentially, a Boxer 6 comprises two inline three-cylinder engines facing away from each other, in bed together, lubed and hot, and yet still managing to engage in a perverted form of copulation by virtue of sharing the same crank. Disgusting. The firing pulses are even per bank, right? So standard exhaust manifolds, one for each bank, are all you need for efficient cylinder scavenging. And they rev like a bastard to those flat sixes because they have rock bottom secondary imbalances intrinsically. And they're on a par with or slightly better than inline sixes on most other balance type criteria, of which there are quite a few. This explains why Porsche is so historically fixated on them. You know, if you want an engine that is gagging to rev its tits off, and it's also wide and low, and it doesn't therefore mind riding right out the back behind the axle, then I think we found a winner. The way Subaru deploys the flat six They go in the front longitudinally, which is kind of lucky because they're wide but they're also short, so they sit a little bit forward of the front axle. The transmission sits behind the engine, it goes between the axles, and that makes it easy to get the all-wheel drive working because you simply take a drive shaft out of the front of the transmission and another one out of the rear, and the job is conveniently done. The design team would doubtless say that there were a few more challenges to make that work, but that's essentially how it all plays out from a packaging perspective. The big advantage of the Boxer is how low it sits. That reduces the centre of mass and that reduces the roll effects when you're cornering, right? So it doesn't require you to slam the car onto the deck, but you can of course do both if you're building a race car. So that's kind of nice. And the main disadvantages are the cost and complexity of manufacturing and the inherent width of the engine. From a how in the name of the fake son of the fake Christian God are we going to cram all of that engine in there 
packaging perspective, a common expression expressed by the Subaru design team, I'm sure. Good luck changing the spark plugs. Although you could say that, I guess, about virtually every modern engine. They certainly design them to be assembled and not worked on. That's for sure. And now this from you. I love it when you talk engineering filth. I'm nursing a hemi here. Engineering porn used to do it for me too, but having watched so much of it now, the most I can manage these days is a kind of half-hearted semi-hemi. That's despite all the lubing, the rubbing, the plugging, the stroking, the sucking, squeezing, banging and blowing, and of course, the cranking. Correction, all systems fully operational. 100% Hemi, yes, all good. Don't you know how to cut the bullshit and come to the point correctly? I am trying to be your follower, but you are not helping. Isn't it just galling when you're gagging to do something? You aspire to it so bad, but you just can't get across the line. There's a workaround for this happily enough, and we will all benefit from it. Simple two-step program. Step number one, disable the core balance relay. It's in the power box outside your home or apartment. Step number two, blow dry your hair. Do it in the shower and the problem will be solved. You will never again feel the burning desire to be an executive producer, happily enough. But you might still be around in a kind of subjective way, in a parallel universe. I'm John Cadogan. If you thought this report was totally nerdy, just look up the quantum suicide immortality thought experiment. Use Google and brace for impact. If you want to go 1000% total nerd, that's how to get there. Or don't. It all depends how the waveform collapses for you in Copenhagen. That's a physicist-only joke. If you don't get it, you don't get it. Thanks for watching. 